What's up fellow exiles, this is Jason and today I wanted to make a video talking about the lore of Path of Exile. Path of Exile is a free to play top down action RPG that features deep character customizations and an end game that is as rewarding as it is frustrating. It is one of the best hack and slash RPGs of this generation and the game offers lore, a lot of lore, over 2000 years worth of history. But the important thing to remember is that history in Rayclass is cyclical in nature with empires rising and dying to cataclysms, all of which is centered around the beast. Under the mountains of Highgate lies a beast. What it is exactly is unclear, but the beast is often referred to as a nightmare or a darkness. It is tremendously powerful. A bit like the monsters in the Cthulhu mythos, the beast is also said to be the source of all thaumaturgy. Thaumaturgy which is basically magic. And under the same mountain came the virtue gems. Virtue gems are basically skill gems but also so much more. What we are told is that there is some sort of intelligence inside the gems which can be mutated and changed. So what we see in game where we put in mana and cast a spell, well that is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to gem abilities. If the beast is the source of Samothergy, then the gems are its interface, how we interact with magic. With those two basics out of the way, we can begin our story, and like any good story, we start at the very beginning. It is now 2000 years before our exile, and we turn our attention to the Val. The most prominent figure at the time was Queen Atsiri, ruler of the Val Empire. She was described to be very beautiful, but also very narcissistic and vain. She held court in a room full of mirrors and that she did so completely in the nude. At her right hand was Doriani. He was said to be an exceptionally talented thaumaturgist. Basically a royal magician who studied and manipulated gems, which the Vol called the Tears of Magi. Atsiri wanted eternal youth, and she tasked Doriani to find a way using Thaumaturgy. In response, Doriani requested human sacrifices. It is worth noting that the Vol had been practicing human sacrifices for a long time. But Doriani was greedy, he wanted more, a lot more, enough to create a river of blood. Atsiri agreed, and time passed with Doriani sacrificing more and more people until one night. The harvest moon shone especially bright that night, and by then, the Vault Empire had blooded citizens dry. Doriani was ready to perform a ritual, something he called a communion. The gems or the Tears of Magi were moved to a place called Doriani's Cradle. And there, Doriani performed a ritual that would ascend the Vault into eternity. The specifics of the ritual are unclear, but we are led to the belief that it failed because Atsiri died, Doriani died, and the Vault People died as well. And a corruption was released that brought the dead back to life as monsters. A cataclysm. A cataclysm. It was a cataclysm. But there was also evidence that the results of the ritual was planned, for Doriani had received visions in the days leading up to the event, possibly influencing his actions. Perhaps it's a work of the beast, or perhaps it's something more sinister. Either way, on that day, the Vault Empire came to an end. The Vault Empire had fought their empire. From here, we move forward by 400 years. It is now 1600 years before our exile. A group calling themselves the Asmeri, a nomadic tribe from the mountains, came upon the ruins of the Vault civilization. And there, they fought off the monsters left behind by Doriani's communion. And upon the ruins of the Vault Empire, founded the Eternal Empire, with the city of Sarn at its heart. The people of the new empire looked upon the remnants of the vault and made a solemn vow to keep their eyes open and to stand vigilant to the dangers of thaumaturgy. They did this by burying the leftover virtue gems under the Highgate Mountains and outlawing the study and use of gems. With this decision, the empire actually saw peace for quite some time and over the next thousand years, nothing really important happens. But wait, there's more. Well, there are several small events that are worth mentioning, such as one story where an emperor by the name of Romero found out that his wife had birthed two kids that weren't his. So he goes completely insane, butchers the two kids and serves them up in the feast, a Romero's banquet. And somehow this series of events ended up with Sarn burning. And then there was the story of Mervale, who had been turned into a fish by an amulet with a corrupted virtue gem. A thousand year passes and it's now 281 years before our exile. And the trend among the emperors at this time was to practice incest, to breed within the family. Bow, chicka, bow, wow, 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 wow. Enter Izaro, the current emperor of the time. The poor guy was so inbred that he was a bit like a potato. Unable to father children and create a line of succession, he took inspirations from the past. Remember the Asmeri people, the original founders of the Eternal Empire? Well, they had an ancient trial that determined the right of succession. Izaro took the ancient right and ramped it up times a hundred, beginning the constructions of a vast labyrinth, a trial that would determine his successor. It was an opportunity for fresh blood to ascend the throne, and the noble families of the Eternal Empire began to plot. Amongst them were the Perendit family. One particular member, a very angry looking Chittis Perendit, 
Hernandez saw an opportunity, and so he conspired with his uncle, the one, the only, Cadiro Perandez. Yes, the same fat man that we all know and love was somehow alive almost 300 years ago. It was explained away through his worship as some sort of family death god. Because sure, why not? Through a series of blackmail, bribery, and murder, they were able to have their agents plant supply caches within the labyrinth, which was still undergoing construction at the time. The same agents whom they promptly murdered to keep their silence. Another advantage they gained was a map of the labyrinth. It was not an easy thing to obtain, requiring a tremendous amount of money and favors, but well worth its weight in gold. It would help him navigate the deadly traps with its brilliant direction of... Go right. Following this set of complicated instructions, Chittis was able to successfully navigate the labyrinth and upon his ascension was crowned heir to the throne. It was years later when Azaro finally retired, passing on his crown to Chittis, whose first act as emperor was to throw the aging Azaro into his own labyrinth, sealing him away for eternity. The Eternal Empire under Chittis was a very different place. He introduced a plan of rapid expansion, invading into their neighbor's territory at great human costs. Of those he conquered, he enslaved, sending them off to labor under the Highgate Mountains, presumably to dig for virtue gems which Chittis recognized as a valuable commodity. Thaumaturgy under Chittis' rule thrived, as did the people studying it, of which there were three, Malagaro, Chavron, and Malachi. This weird looking dude is Malagaro, and according to the graphic novels, he discovered a way to distill the essence of virtue gems, and using Malagaro's spike inject it into his victims, creating horrible monsters. Through this method, he created the White Beast and the Lightning Strike monster in the Chamber of Sins. Also had a fetish for spiders, and probably created the Weaver as well. He was f he was really weird. Perhaps the greatest of the three Thamartages is Malachi. He was said to have a talent that surpasses peers, rivaling Doriani of the Vol and under his tenure, he created the Gemling army. He was also the master or lover of Dahlia, whom he seemed to have a genuine affection for, but that didn't stop him from turning her into the Gemling queen, which really says a lot about his character. As the empire changed, there also rose discontent among its citizens. Some still remember the Eternal Empire's founding creed, to keep their eyes open and to be vigilant of the dangers of gems. Most prominent amongst them were two people. There was Vol, who was a bit of a fanatic and had a thing for purity. No, not purity the woman, but purity the concept. He was an excellent fighter. There was also Victorio, called the People's Poet. He was a charismatic man and had a way with words. Together, the two saw an opportunity, for in his rapid expansion, Emperor Chittis Perindus had invaded into his neighbor's territories. The groups of people there were weak individually, but together, well, the time was right for war. And so, Victoria went to negotiate an alliance between the three groups to plan the beginnings of the Purity Rebellion. One was Ameriketh. They were located in the north east ish We don't really know where they're located, just that they lived in the plains and rode Roas. Yeah, Roas. Another group was the Ezomites, led by Rigwald. They were probably in the west-ish... Again, it's unclear where their territory begins, but we can assume that they were fearsome fighters. After all, abysses were named after these guys. The final group, the Karui, are located in the south, near the beaches in Act 1. The year is 1333, roughly 300 years before our exile, and the drums of war are just starting to beat. The Purity Rebellion has begun. The following story is an abridged version from a four-part graphics novel series, which detail the Purity Rebellion, the link for which can be found below. Victoria was able to convince the Kurui to attack Lion Eye's Watch, promising the southern land should the Eternal Empire fall. Under the cover of darkness, Comb and his men made their attack, landing on the beach in their wooden canoes. They began to slowly creep their way towards the keep. But before they could get too close, they ran across a patrol. Luckily, the Kurui band were not seen, for the patrols were using torches and couldn't see very far in the dark. With a swing of their axe, the Kurui ambushed and cut down the patrol. But then, disaster. For the torches they had been carrying had fallen onto the ground, and ignited a line of oil which slithered onto nearby kindling. The resulting bonfire could be seen for miles around the flat beach. It appeared that the Eternals had been ready for the Kurui. The patrol had been a trap. A scream came above the walls. Fire! Fire! Say one thing about the Kurui. Say that they didn't have a head for strategy. Because they had landed within bow range of the keep, and so their canoes were set aflame. They hadn't brought any siege weapons or even ranged weapons, for the Kurui were a superstitious lot, who believed strongly in tradition. And one of their proverb goes, when eye meets eye, axe meets axe. 
which meant that they only used melee weapons, forsaking ranged weapons as dishonorable. They also didn't believe in retreat. Perhaps they should have invested in intelligence. It was a massacre as the Kurui stared down at a rain of burning arrows, unable to attack and refusing to retreat. But then, suddenly, a voice rang out. Hold your arrows, man. <coughs> I mean, oh my god, hold your arrows, man. It was Marcus Lion Eyes, the commander of the keep. Perhaps it was arrogance or perhaps it was hubris, but he ordered his men to drop their bowls. And then, he opened the gates and with bow in hand, led his men to meet the Kurui in melee. Unbeknownst to both groups, another player had entered the field. A storm of arrows flew through the sky, originating from a hill overlooking the combatants. The arrows flew ponderously through the air before landing in Lion Eye's forces. Hiri, King Combs niece, and her sisters had joined the fray. Kurui men were the fighters in their culture and were forbidden to use projectile weapons, but the same didn't apply for Kurui women. With a single twang of her bowstring, Hiri forever changed the Kurui way. The forces of Marcus Lion Eyes were slaughtered to the last man. Lion Eye falls. The Kurui were not kind conquerors, putting every man, woman, and children in the keep to the sword. By the dawn, the keep had been bathed in the blood of the Eternals. Chavron as the Ma Atergist had been in the area, and seeing the defeat of the Empire fled north to the prison, and there she did two things. First, she sealed off the road from the prison to the western forest. Then she met with the warden of the prison and offered him a choice. In her hands, she held two options, insanity and revelation. The warden chose revelation. Somewhere along the way, Shavra must have lost control because she was killed by the same creature she had created. And although Chavron had been able to halt the Karui advance, the Eternal Empire had lost the south. But it was a similar story in the north and west as well. The Marakath had won their own battles, as had the Ezomites under the command of Rigwald. And slowly the Alliance pushed their way inwards, chipping away at the forces of the Eternal Empire until they were at the gates of Sarn. Victorio, the people's poet, rouses citizens of the Empire, the poor, the destitute, into open revolts. It felt inevitable at this point that the Empire would fall. But the Empire had one last weapon, Thaumaturgy. We know Chavron was dead at the hand of Brutus, and Malagaro was probably dead by then as well, leaving only Malachi, who had spent his time following up on Malagaro's research. Only instead of creating monsters, he refined the technique and created the Gemling Legion, an amalgamation of humanity and virtue gems, a perfect soldier. And at the head of this army was a Gemling Queen. Vol's army clashed with the Gemling Legion outside the gates of Sarn. And while massively outnumbering the defenders, Vol's forces ground to a stalemate against the Legion. But then, the Gemling Queen joined the fray, shooting lasers out of her hands like a Sith Lord. Vol's forces were repelled and left the battle to lick their wounds. Victorio had been at the battle, but he'd fled into the city. He was a charismatic person, but he was not a fighter. But even he knew that this was not a battle that could be won by force. The Gemling army was too powerful. In comes another player, Lord Ondar, whom after watching the slaughter at the city gates, could no longer sit idly by. For Lord Ondar was a good friend of the Emperor's and was a confidant to his secrets. Secrets, which he told Victorio. Malachi had built his Gemling army with a kill switch, kill the Emperor and the army falls. And so together, Victorio and Ondar schemed a single strike to end a war. They waited until the Night of a Thousand Ribbons, when Sarn would hold a yearly celebration. The Emperor would be in attendance. It was a light-hearted night, a masquerade for the nobles of the city, with dancing and drink flowing in abundance. When a shout rang through the air, Death to Sin! Rawr! and now poured a group of men wielding blades, cutting down the unarmed partygoers, but it was only a distraction. And while the Emperor was distracted, Lord Ondar sneaked behind his back and delivered a fatal strike to his friend. But the Emperor had undergone the beginning procedures to turn himself into a gemling, and he had a higher than average resilience. With his final breath, the Emperor struck down his friend. It appeared that Ondar's guile could not save him from the Emperor's wrath. The Emperor fell, the gemlings fell, and the Empire falls. The next day, Vol came through the gates as a conquering hero and was crowned the new emperor. But it was said that the old emperor's body hadn't even cooled yet before Malachi was whispering in Vol's ears. Initially, Vol was all for burning Malachi in the crematorium before suddenly Malachi said change his mind. For Malachi promised an end to Thamaturgy to burn it out at his source. Vol accepted. He was a bit of an idiot. And over the next five years, the Empire fell into decline. Vol was not a good ruler. 
And during this time, Malachi cloistered himself in the Solaris Temple, building a rapture device, a machine designed to kill the beast. And upon its completion, Malachi took his Gemling Queen and his device, and they made their way to Highgate. The history of Path of Exile is rather cyclical in nature. The Empire had begun because of the beast, and will end for the same reason. Under the mountains of Highgate, Malachi and Dahlia prepared the rapture device, which would require a fuel source, a Gemling Queen. But Dahlia refused to be the sacrifice, and it's heavily implied that Malachi had been expecting this. But without his fuel source, the rapture device was only able to bore a tiny hole. Enough for Malachi to squeeze through. And then... Cataclysm. Cataclysm! Corruption spread through the lands, and fire rained down from the sky as the world burned, and the people died. Then they came back to life as monsters. In a single moment, Ray class was changed forever. Oh, except for Oriath, for some reason the people there made it out fine. And Malachi, well, Malachi wasn't able to finish what he started, which is why the exile had to go back in 300 years later and kill his ass. Which brings us back to the current day. But what does it all mean? From here, we can only speculate. Personally, I think the beast is a symptom, a tool, a mindless tool of that, of something more sinister. Everything revolves around Thaumaturgy and the beast. All the monsters, Brutus, Dominus, Piety, Malachi, the Cataclysms, were all a result of Thaumaturgy, but it was produced through human actions. Except for one particular case, a story of Mervale, who was turned into a monster by a necklace with a corrupted virtue gem. We know that virtue gems doesn't induce such mutations, because the Gemling Queen had been around for almost 300 years, and while slightly eccentric, she appears to be fine. So we can reason that it's the corruption that caused the change. And we know that Doriani and Malachi were influenced by an outside source, as described by a unique amulet designed by Chris Wilson. The blood of corruption! My reach knows no bounds. All that is pure is destined to rot, and all that lives is destined to serve. Corruption. Corruption. Corruption is at the center of everything. Corruption of the lands, corruption of the people, and corruption with unlimited reach that appears to have an intelligence behind its actions. It would even explain the Shaper, who saw too much and was touched by the corruption, hence his obsessiveness with perfection. But what is the source of the corruption, and whom is it that the corrupted serve? Well, the beast certainly seems like a likely candidate, since it's a source of thaumaturgy, which caused a cataclysm which corrupted the lands and created the monsters. But in a game where you can travel through maps, where extra-dimensional monsters invade, anything is possible. Thank you guys for watching this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos discussing the lore in video games and TV shows. Most likely Game of Thrones. Boop, 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 boop.